Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the Kirby Institute's uh, seminar series. My name is Nikadim Stedla. I'm a, an immunopathologist. I act as a child between uh, the Kirby and the School of Medical Sciences. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodian of the land uh, for which we gather today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Today I'm chairing this seminar from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people joining us today. Uh, some housekeeping stuff that we need to do is um, um, the format of the seminar will start off with a presentation. This will be followed by Q&A at the end. To ask a question, uh, click on the icon on the on the right upper uh, edge of the Teams page, which has a question mark uh, on on it, and uh, that bubble. And when you click Ask a Question. Please remember to write your name so that I could uh, kind of uh, introduce you. This will help also to refer your question and make uh, the answering easier. Uh, today's uh, seminar topic is uh, uh, characterization, the characterizing the respiratory variant of SARS-CoV-2 uh, cases presented by Dr. Kim Wo Kim. Dr. Kim is a lecturer and uh, journal diabetes. Uh, uh, Research Foundation International Postdoctoral Fellow at the Women's and Children's Ho uh, Hospital and Health at the NSW. He completed his uh, honors class one and PhD at the, at the University of Sydney, specializing in molecular biology and genetics. He leads the virus and diabetes research group within the, the NSW affiliated uh, virology research laboratory. And he is a co leader of the virology team within the National Environmental Determinants of Islet Autoimmunity. Uh, he, they are working with more than 1500 mothers and infant pairs with the first degree relative with type 1 diabetes. Uh, please welcome Dr. Kirk, and uh, I'll uh, hand him over. And I'm very excited to hear about this really exciting topic. Thank you. Thank you, Nicodemus. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity um, to present today. Um, and, and thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so as you've heard, I'm actually a, a, mainly a type 1 diabetes research focused um, postdoctoral researcher. And today is a bit of a, um, a, a side topic for me um, and, and story about uh, the work that uh, I've been involved as part of the UNSW. Uh, rapid response COVID research um, that still, you know, that happened last year and then still ongoing. And it's a collaborative, collaborative effort between um, multiple sites and institutes. Um, so just the contents for today's talk, I'll, I'll give a brief background of, of myself um, to put everything into context and how I became involved in this uh, rapid response research group. Um, and then move on to you know, the, the, the rationale for why we started looking into respiratory viral co-infections uh, in, in SARS-CoV-2 cases in New South Wales um, and why we opted to um, use uh, what we call the virome capture sequencing approach. Um, so for the purposes of this talk, when I say virome, uh, we're, we're pretty much just focusing on uh, viruses that can infect vertebrates, um, so humans and other vertebrates and, and deliberately excluding phages and, and endogenous retroviruses. Um, and then basically go through the results of, of what we found. Um, and I, I wanted to end with sort of a discussion that, that opened that up to, to, to the audience about you know, what we think, um, whether we should be worried about you know, co-infections at all, um, and, and really the, focusing on the impact of you know, what social distancing and lockdown measures um, have had on other viruses. Um, so very briefly, so I'm not a virologist, so this talk may may seem very basic to, to some of you, so apologies in advance for that. 
Um, my PhD has actually, was actually in um, small non-coding RNAs and, and actually in, in plant uh, model Arabidopsis in, in tobacco plants. So um, that's a long way back, um, about seven years ago, uh, I completed my PhD and then completely switched fields to uh, look at the viral etiology of type 1 diabetes, um, starting work at UNSW with Professor Maria Craig and Professor Bill Rowlandson. Um, and as Nicodemus mentioned, I'm part of, uh, and I lead the virology theme uh, with Maria and Bill uh, in this nationwide perspective cohort study that's uh, following 1500 at-risk infants and mothers, uh, all having first degree relative with type 1 diabetes. And this is, and we're primarily um, focused on the viruses and how um, viruses can potentially trigger and accelerate uh, the development of type 1 diabetes. And so we've been doing this work since uh, 2015, trying to characterize the longitudinal virome uh, in pregnancy and infancy and um, using a, a, an approach called virome capture sequencing. Um, and really the primary focus in, has been on the gut virome, uh, mainly because of a strong um, association both molecular and epidemiological um, between enteroviruses and type 1 diabetes. Um, but really, even before the, the, the COVID-19 um, pandemic, we were uh, gearing up and planning to look at the respiratory virome in India. And if you want to know more about India study, I've left the link there. Um, so when um, Bill um, spearheaded this uh, rapid response uh, research group uh, with the following two aims. Um, it just naturally uh, opened doors for me to be involved um, primarily for the aim two here, uh, which was trying to look at co-infections between SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory viruses using the virome capture sequencing approach. Um, the primary aim for this you know, collaborative research was actually um, number one here, which was actually using um, amplicon based NGS approach, both uh, nanopore and illumina uh, to, 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 to track um, genomic changes in, in SARS-CoV-2. Um, and it's, it, it's, this collaboration is continuing and I've just put um, faces of the key uh, players here and you'll notice um, Rowena plays a, a huge part in this group, um, as well as Ira um, from Garvin, um, Sebastian from the Mary Bashir Institute, and um, Sacha Stelzer Braid, who I work uh, along with at the Virology Research Laboratory. Um, and the, the two aims um, have resulted in the following publication. So I'll be focusing on, on mine on um, the respiratory viral co infection. So if you'd like to know more, um, and if I haven't covered any aspects, um, then please. Um, have a read of those papers. So the, the rationale for why we wanted to look at respiratory viral co-infections in the first place was really from this paper um, in JAMA that was published um, early on in the pandemic. Um, so they reported a 20% um, rate or prevalence of co-infection with other respiratory viruses in Northern California, and this was um, using samples uh, that were tested between you know, 3rd and 25th of March. So prior to this paper in, in, in Wuhan, they were um, reporting you know, little to none um, in terms of co-infections, but this paper really um, put into spotlight, should we be looking at co-infections? Um, and this is still re remains the most highly cited paper on co-infections with SARS-CoV-2 to this day. Um, and then there were, you know, several papers that, um, you know, pockets of, of analyses done all over the world um, that were claiming that, you know, there were potentially higher mortality among um, COVID patients that, that had um, other viral co-infections. Um, and then at the time when we started this work, um, there were no co-infection data on the Southern Hemisphere population. So we thought in, in many respects, um, you know, it was worthwhile pursuing um, this work. And you can see the, the range of different respiratory viruses that were detected um, in this table. So 
um, influenza RSV mainly and rhinovirus is being the most uh, frequent and, and other um, coronaviruses as well. So we set out with the following aims. Um, so determine the co-infection rate. Uh, we had 92 SARS-CoV-2 cases that were diagnosed in New South Wales um, between March to, to May. Um, so we had um, samples stored for those um, and, and we could test and using the, the two different um, hybridization capture sequencing approaches we thought um, you know we had been using a lot in the NDS study a, a pan viral panel um, and then we wanted to incorporate a more recently developed um, capture panel that were developed from twist biosciences which was specifically focusing on respiratory viruses only um, and then we wanted to see you know whether we can characterize the genomes of, of these virus co-infecting viruses as well as the SARS-CoV-2 um, and finally uh, to, to validate results using um, three different bioinformatic pipelines that were published so these were IDC, map and one codex um, so this is just the overview of the wet work method. Um, so we had nasopharyngeal swabs um, resuspended in, in viral transport medium. Um, and then the, the cases uh, were diagnosed by uh, diagnostic qPCR. Um, that's the age range there. And, and as I said, they were diagnosed between March to May in New South Wales. Uh, we used the column based um, extraction approach. Um, I would not recommend this for, for a higher uh, number of samples, but you know, 92 was manageable. Um, and then these two are the two capture panels that we, um, we used. Uh, so it's a vercap seek, I'll call it, and, and that was manufactured by Roche. Um, and this is the panel that we had most um, experience with at the time. So this is a pan viral panel um, that we used a lot in our gut virum analyses. Um, consisting of two million oligonucleotide probes with varying lengths, um, targeting all known vertebrate infectious viruses. Um, and then the alternative um, panel that we, we tested was a more recently developed, so sort of after the, the COVID-19 pandemic, so a lot more probes um, dedicated for SARS-CoV-2 and uniform um, length in terms of oligomers. Um, and then it was focusing on 29 respiratory, human respiratory viruses. So considerably less number of probes compared to the 2 million. Um, both methods are what you would categorize as some would call it target enrichment sequencing. It's also known as hybridization capture sequencing, so sh and, and shortened by hybrid capture. Um, it, it, it's a capture process that happens um, post library prep. So you, you prepare your next generation sequencing libraries um, and then basically you have these blockers that will block any non-specific binding and then um, you have these probes that are specific for uh, the viral sequences of interest um, that will target uh, the, the RNA of, or DNA. Um, so all the RNA would have been converted to cDNA, so it's, it's all actually working at the DNA level. Um, but after hybridization of the targets of interest, you, you clean it up and, and purify using magnetic bead purification. Um, so it's, it's not a very um, complex method and it's been widely applied um, prior in, in you know, the cancer genomic space. And, and this has really become popularized, um, particularly in the past few years um, in the virum sequencing space, because if you were to do a straight sequencing of any um, clinical or environmental sample, um, it's really a needle in the haystack to, to, to sequence um, viral sequences, um, because you know, this majority of viral sequences that you will recover is actually phage, or dietary viruses or plant viruses, um, and most of the reads typically will be bacterial or human host sequences. And um, you know, many 
different groups have um, over the years used different approaches. So physical enrichment used to be um, what people would have attempted in the past. So using combination of filtering by size, um, ultra centrifugation or, or centrifuging at different speeds. Um, but then sequence capture is, is sort of the more um, cutting edge uh, approach. So it can be actually, you know, you would have heard of ribosomal RNA depletion. So you can use it to actually deplete host sequences or sequences that you're not interested in. Um, or you can, as I briefly mentioned before, to enrich the targets of interest using, um, in this case, viral probes. So you can adapt in different ways. And some, some groups do use both depletion uh, followed by enrichment to en enhance their sensitivity. So without further ado, um, this is what it looked like when we used uh, vercap seq so that pan viral um, panel. Um, and uh, applying a, an arbitrary cutoff um, of 20 viral reads per million raw reads as, as a positive positivity threshold. Um, we, we found 47 viral species belonging to 17 genera, um, but really highlighting or separated by this um, horizontal line here. Uh, anything above that are the respiratory viruses. So we, being a pan viral panel, the, the, the negatives in this case, we know these are nasopharyngeal swabs um, and, and we're only really interested in the respiratory viruses. You're going to actually detect a lot of, um, you know, what you might think is junk or, or contaminating viruses or, or viruses that really don't, um, you know, contribute much to your um, interpretation. So um, using this panel, we actually only managed to, to get 80% um, of samples. So of the 92 samples, so that, these are samples that had previously already been tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 using diagnostic qPCR, um, but using this approach, we only managed to get SARS-CoV-2 reads um, in 80% of, of the samples using this approach. Um, we didn't find any COVID um, or SARS-CoV-2 sequences in the negative controls, which are the first two columns here. Um, but you notice that so beta coronavirus is, is the SARS-CoV-2 reads represented here. And you'll see a lot of blanks here um, because we, we just failed to recover. And we, you know, the, the main reason for this without going into too much detail is that um, there were multiple freeze thaw cycles um, before it actually um, received our hands for testing with SARS -CoV uh, with the viral capture sequencing. Um, so from this, uh, we actually found 5% of samples tested uh, positive for rhinovirus sequences and 2% um, tested positive for influenza virus. Um, of the 92 um, samples tested using BRCAPC, we also um, had enough uh, cDNA to actually test using the second panel, the human uh, respiratory virus panel from TWIST. So 83 samples in total. Um, and what you'll notice straight away is that there are a lot less uh, blanks here, meaning that we managed to actually recover SARS-CoV-2 uh, reads as we would expect um, in 95% of the samples that we tested. Um, and as I mentioned before, that the freeze thaw was an issue. And actually, when we repeat tested, so all of these samples, we did qPCR again for SARS-CoV-2. And basically, these blanks um, corresponded to the samples that were in, in our, our hands, the qPCR results were negative. So it was concordant between the sequencing result and, and the, the repeated qPCR. Um, and again, um, the respiratory viruses detected were rhinovirus and influenza virus. Um, you'll notice it's it's a lot cleaner, this heat map, um, mainly because you don't have all the other non-respiratory viruses. Um, but we did detect a, a, a you know, small amount of reads that corresponded to cytomegalovirus, for instance, here. But it's actually um, a hit to repetitive 
regions within the um, human host sequences. So a lot of the times when you're trying to look at metagenomic data, there's a lot of um, manual filtering to work out um, what's relevant and what's irrelevant. Um, and one way to get, get by that is, is, you know, using different cutoff thresholds for positivity thresholds. Um, but in this case, a lot of manual work is done. Um, so putting them side by side, um, so this is looking at all viruses, again, showing how messy pan viral analysis can be. Um, but if you put side by side, um, you know, that the, the blanks of the SARS-CoV-2 are, are sort of non-existent for twist, uh, meaning that we were able to recover a lot of the SARS-CoV-2 reads. Um, and then the concordance of co-infecting viruses detected, you know, was, was good. Um, but really, we, we had uh, one extra um, rhinovirus hit here for twist. Um, so, in, in, you know, in conclusion, we, we, we found 8% of co-infection. We couldn't really comment too much um, beyond that because we didn't have uh, ethics to, to look at clinical data or, or they weren't followed up for um, what their clinical outcomes were. So we couldn't um, comment further on that except an 8% co-infection rate. Um, just before we published, uh, we, we the, there was a, another pub paper published um, that had looked at um, using multiplex qPCR um, uh, cases that were confirmed um, from the same region around the same uh, period in, in, in the pandemic. Um, and, and sort of consistent with our findings um, that the overall uh, co-infection rate detected was 5%. Um, and this figure from that paper actually shows, you know, the, the impact of how the different restrictions um, have led to a drastic reduction in terms of you know, influenza as well as rhinovirus um, circulating um, in, in the population. So it was good to see that consistent um, co-infection rate. Um, I mentioned that we use multiple bioinformatic pipelines to validate. So, so IDSeq we found to be um, the most sensitive. Um, and we knew that these samples should be SARS-CoV-2 positive. So that's that's a way in which we, we sort of knew that this IDSeq platform was, um, you know, confirming the SARS-CoV-2 presence the best out of these three pipelines. Um, and then between IDSeq and VermAP, which are both de novo based approaches in terms of uh, contig assembly, um, they were concordant for the enterovirus and rhinovirus positive sequences, uh, samples. Um, and one codex is a KMER based, so alignment based uh, pipeline, uh, which actually had the least sensitivity and um, in terms of both SARS-CoV-2 and uh, um, co-infecting viruses detected. Um, one thing we noticed straight away was compared to VercapSeq and the TWIST panel, uh, the, the genome coverage, so the distribution of reads covering the different positions of the SARS-CoV-2 genome was far more even for TWIST uh, compared to Roche. Um, and this is not so surprising in that, you know, when VercapSeq panel was developed or the probes were designed, it was um, four or five years before SARS-CoV-2 um, was added to the reference genome database. So um, you would expect a lot of patchiness. So the regions that SARS-CoV-2 reads are actually being recovered, are, you know, the probes that were designed for other um, human coronaviruses. So because of the homology, they're binding these probes, um, but there are regions clearly that are being missed and, and contributing to this patchiness. Um, with the other co-infecting respiratory viruses, um, one benefit of this target um, enrichment or capture approach is that you can get 
in this case, uh, an example of near full length influenza virus A. Um, and uh, although patchy here, um, it's really dependent on how you know, the viral load of the co-infecting virus, but you can still cover large chunks of um, rhinovirus as shown here. Um, and then the question is, you know, what, you know, Amplicon versus um, hybrid capture. So what we thought um, was interesting was that using the capture approach, you can pretty much achieve what you would um, get for a, a targeted amplicon based sequencing approach targeted to only for SARS CoV 2. So you can have this dual, um, I guess, function in that you can get whole genome sequence of SARS CoV 2 characterized uh, and at the same time simultaneously characterize the co infecting viruses. So that would be a, a benefit moving forward um, if cost and time. Um, limitations are overcome. Um, and we found that a CT of 30 was kind of the threshold for, for success um, using the capture based method. So if you had a sample that's lower than CT value of 30, which was equivalent to approximately 3000 copies uh, per mil of SARS CoV 2 RNA, um, with the twist capture method, you are able to get um, more than 90% of the SARS-CoV-2 genome covered with greater than 10x uh, depth um, from 95% of the sample. So the dotted line here, vertical, um, showing the CT value of 30, um, and one here represents 100% um, genome coverage. And again, you, you would see that it was a lot more um, consistent for twi twists. So you can see this, you know, almost like falling off a cliff after if you go beyond CT of 30 um, for twist in terms of genome coverage. Um, but with FERCAP C, you get a lot of patchy. So even below 30 CT value of 30, you're getting some samples with less than half of the genome sequence covered, um, some samples with high percentage of genomes covered. Um, I guess, although this doesn't happen a lot, a, a, a scenario where a, there's a clear advantage of using capture-based approach um, over an amplicon-based sequencing approach is when there's a, a large mutation in the SARS-CoV-2 genome um, that might span a primer binding site. So in this case, we had one sample uh, where you know, the, the primer binding site for this B7 amplicon was knocked out by an ORF8 deletion. Um, and then so in the panel below, which is a nanopore amplicon based sequencing approach, you get this gap of no sequences, um, sequence gene, what well, genome sequence coverage because that amplicon did not amplify, um, whereas with the twist capture panel, um, you get this continuous coverage of genome right up to the flanking region of the deletion. So in summary, you know, we, we didn't detect that 20% co-infection rate that had been um, reported from Southern California, uh, Northern California, we, we found 8% co-infection rate uh, the co-infecting viruses that we detected were rhinovirus and influenza. Um, and the, the twist panel, more so than VERCAPC, really um, stood out to us as, as, as a method for dual functionality, being able to characterize whole genome sequence of SARS-CoV-2, but also characterize the co-infecting viruses. Um, and the primer independence nature is, is uh, provides that advantage over whole genome sequencing approach. Now reports since then, so there's another um, paper that reported 7% co-infection rate in France. Um, this actually a sample really early on in the pandemic, so January to March 2020. Um, and then it's just, you know, 
too difficult to keep track of all the publications. So uh, it's really handy to have these systematic reviews um, done from time to time. And this is the most recent one I could find on co-infections, uh, which covered 33 studies that included 10,000 um, plus COVID patients um, between diagnosed between December 2019 and 2020. Um, and they report that there was a 4.3% 4, 4 pool prevalence of, of co-infection between SARS-CoV-2 and other respiratory virus. Um, and interestingly, a, a much higher um, co-infection rate with blood-borne viruses like HIV and HCV. And this is the conclusion directly out of the paper. I just put this here to, to highlight the fact that we actually still don't know very much about whether co-infections can lead to you know, higher morbidity, mortality, uh, and worsen clinical outcomes. Um, so there's a lot more still to be done. And the impact of social distancing, you, you can't um, ignore. This is uh, recent data published in JAMA from Singapore. Um, surveillance of, of respiratory virus infections um, during 2019 and 2020. And you can see again, similar to that paper um, that looked at uh, cases from the St. Vincent's um, testing site, uh, a massive drop in, in all um, respiratory viruses uh, during lockdown periods. Um, so this represented uh, results from 42,000 plus um, test results that were conducted during the pandemic. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to open it up to the experts um, in the audience, you know, should we really be concerned about co-infections given such low rates uh, being reported all over the world? Um, you know, there's limited data, um, so I, I handpicked one here um, which is from Bai et al. published in Cell Research, a, a mouse model. They demonstrated that co-infection with influenza A and SARS-CoV-2 actually increases the viral load of SARS-CoV-2 and, and leads to a more severe lung damage. Um, I think there's a, that, well, a lot of factors that complicate the interpretation between um, different studies. Um, mainly because the variations in severity of social distancing and lockdown measures are so extremely different between, say, Australia and the US and, and Europe, um, and obviously differences in climate, um, different circulating variants of concern. Um, and I think the major issue, and, and as demonstrated from our results as well, is that all of these studies reporting co-infection rates are based on retrospective testing, not on the actual samples that usually are the diagnostic specimen that, that di diagnoses the, the, the patients of having SARS-CoV-2, but leftover um, samples that have either gone through multiple free stores or um, have kept at suboptimal storage conditions prone to degradation. Um, so that um, on that note, I wanted to thank everyone involved um, from the Virology Research Laboratory, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 Rapid Response Research Group, um, and other collaborators, um, namely Mark Wilkins from um, the what, director of Ramachari, um and uh, Dr. Ignatius Pang, who was postdoc of Mark at the time as well as UNSW rest outside. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was a fantastic um, presentation. And uh, uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this presentation. And I'll, uh, now the, the session is open for question. And uh, do, you could uh, write your questions on the uh, Q&A, so, so, uh, uh, just write what Ever question you like, but I'll, I'll probably start the ball rolling while people are putting their question on. Um, I was just wondering, like, if you were to uh, say that they have, there are two, there is a viral 
like influenza virus as well as um, maybe uh, the rhinovirus, did they have uh, an immune response to them or not? Like, uh, did they, anyone check if there's an antibody or any? Yeah, so we, we on the patients or on the case samples that we tested, we don't have any serological data um, kept. Uh, we had gone for a New South Wales Health grant um, following those results um, to, to, to test more samples with uh, proper ethics to follow up their clinical history as well as serological data. Um, but but we couldn't, you know, we, we weren't successful for that. Um, but from other groups, yes, there have been, um, particularly for influenza A co-infection, um, the, the immune response is actually um, exacerbated and um, can lead to more severe outcomes. So that's actually been from multiple case reports rather than large um, samples tested, but yes. Okay, and then we have a question from Bra uh, Braulio. It's just, uh, he, he really enjoyed your presentation, by the way, that's really great. How severe were the SARS-CoV-2 cases co-infected with the rhino and the influenza? Yeah, so we, so of those, um, the, they, they weren't um, severe cases. They were mostly asymptomatic, the ones that we tested. Um, and uh, none of the co-infected patients were the ones that were from, um, you know, hospitalization hospitalized patients or, or the ones that um, ended up in ICU, um, which we didn't include at the, uh, in the paper, um, the ICU patients. But, yeah. and any, any more questions? Waiting. Um, if, if, no, if no one has any question, I, can, I could easily ask more. Uh, one of the questions I'll ask is the uh, uh, question of cost. If you were to think of the the two, the twist and the the Roche one, uh, what's the the main like what's what's the cost, and also the logistical, like which one is much more could be streamlined and upscaled or not? Yeah, so the cost, um, and, and we I looked closely into this, so um, mainly for the fact that we want to roll this out to testing of you know about. 12 or 1300 throat swabs in the NDS study for the longitudinal um, respiratory virome analysis. Um, and between Vercapsic and, and TWIST, there's not a lot of um, cost difference. Uh, between Amplicon sequencing and Capture, um, it really depends. So it, unlike Amplicon sequencing, um, the Capture actually happens in a multiplex format. So you pull multiple up to so we've tested up to 21 um, and you can go further than that. So it's really dependent on that, but based on, you know, pulling at at least 24 samples um, and sequencing in batches of 96 on, on, on the Illumina NervaSeq, um, the cost is really around $200 per sample to get the full, yeah. And in practical sense, they are similar. Like when, if you in logistically, like can you train me, for example, I'm, I'm not a molecular biologist or a virologist, like how, how difficult are they to, or how different are they in terms of? Uh, I, I think it's it's actually simpler than, than cap, Amplicon capture sequencing in that you don't actually have to generate Amplicons prior uh, and then proceed to library prep. So you just, do a library prep of your cDNA or, or DNA mixture. Um, and then once they're in library form, it's it's uh, overnight or it can be a fast hive depending on the buffer you use. Um, so the, the results I presented are based on two hour hybridization and then clean up, then proceed to sequencing. Um, but it can also be an overnight um, hybridization. So and by that, I'm just saying, you know, you you put your probes, the blockers capture. It's a incubation, all done in a PCR machine. Yeah. Uh, we've got a, a question from Nasir. Uh, if you are to use fresh 
uh, serum or plasma instead of frozen would would you think will improve sensitivity yeah definitely um and we we see that not just with um the samples here but from you know my experiences in the clinical specimens for stool plasma um, from endia as well as some wastewater samples that we've been testing um they it's always you know best to minimize freeze thaw and what i would always um, recommend is particularly for rna viruses you should extract and at least convert to cdna the first strand cdna on the same day um, because it's it's a lot more stable in cdna form great and um, we've got another uh, interesting question from brawler how feasible is it to include bacteria i think that's a great question uh, bacteria pathogen into the respiratory panel uh, i he clear saying that bacterial co-infection is the main determinant of severity for example in influenza. sure yeah um so it's definitely um feasible and, and these are, I guess, would categorize onto, and you can basically custom design any um, target probes, um, but obviously cost goes higher because this is, you know, would be specific to your project. And I, I actually looked into doing a custom design with TUS recently um, to just contain, you know, respiratory virus and viruses that have been associated with type 1 diabetes, for example. Um, that and that actually costs more than getting the their version of pan viral panel which contains everything um, because they mass produce so it really depends but I know from Illumina they 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 they've been looking into uh, creating a, a a respiratory pathogen panel that includes both bacteria and viral so if you need um, more information I'm happy to forward you that. I mean, in conversation with them about potential beta testing. Yeah. Uh, um, Nasir is asking again, cost related uh, uh, question between the Anticon based versus the, the, the capture uh, type. How, how do you think the cost compares? Um, yeah, at the moment, without a doubt, Ampicon sequencing is um, still more affordable. Um, but I think that's because we haven't fully determined up to how much we can multiplex um, and get the desired um, sequencing depth. And what Ampicon, it can never be exclusively Ampicon or target enrichment, um, because I think Amplicon has a slighter edge in terms of sensitivity, so the samples that go beyond TT value of 30. Um, but in terms of cost, it's actually, if you ask me a couple of years ago, it would be no way. Um, but it's actually now getting to the area where it's very compatible and competitive. Um, and, and there's, at many stages, you can actually cut costs. Um, so, um, so I'd be happy to um, discuss that offline if you would like to know. Yeah. Any more questions? Seems like no. Well, that that was a fantastic talk. I've, I've learned a lot, at least personally, and thank you so much. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking um, Dr. Uh, Kim. Uh, for his absolutely fantastic presentation and have a great afternoon everyone thank you